in the sense of a church. It's when you talk endlessly to the pastor at the back door when people are trying to get through. It's called <laughs> blocking. Extra point. How many think I know what that is? That's when you tell the pastor he preached a great sermon. Amen. You get extra point. Sermon's too short. Extra point. Okay. Illegal motion. It's when you leave the auditorium for the closing prayer. Okay. Quarterback sneak. That's when classroom teachers get into their classrooms five minutes later than they should have. Staying in the pocket. It's what happens a lot of time at offering time. Now you see why I'm saying it now and not before the... <clears throat> the two-minute warning. That's that point in time in the service when you realize the sermon's almost over and you begin to get your code and your purse and your kids. Sudden death. That's what happens in the faces of the people of the congregation when the pastor goes overtime. <laughs> and finally, the blitz. It's the rush to the restaurant after the last amen. Amen. How many understand the relationship between the church and... Okay, good. The past four weeks I've been sharing a message called Redemption, and we've gone over different parts. I'm not going to go through a big summary, but I'll just tell you that we've been preaching the last four weeks and understand that redemption is what Jesus did. He redeemed us. Our sin has caused us to have a very high sin price on our head. And the only way that that can be paid is by the blood of Jesus Christ. The only sacrifice that was worthy to pay the sin price, that was valuable enough to pay my sin price and yours, was the blood of God's own Son. Say a good amen. And because he worshipped us, I mean, because we worship him, because we've been redeemed, we do worship him. I'll get that out. We worship him because we love God. God loves us. That's why he sent his Son. So I love God because he first loved me. The motivation for all worship is God. The motivation for all the things that we do as a result of being redeemed is our love for God. These things that we do for God, these things that have happened to us, even what God has initiated on his own self is done because of his love. See, because God really doesn't need anything per se. The only thing God cannot give himself we know he can give himself gold. We know he can give himself pearl. We know he can create humans. We know he can give people life. But the only thing that God cannot give himself is worship. Because to give worship, that means that you're acknowledging someone higher than yourself. And God, there's no one higher than him. So it must be that the re a redeemed man that's free to worship is, worships God because he acknowledges the fact that God is higher than himself. Then we are redeemed to serve. Jesus set the example for service, and he said, the greatest among you are not the first, it's those that serve. It's those that serve. In this instant, the first shall be last, and the last shall get a crown. It's not that way in our lives today. The greatest are not the people that are your employees many times. The greatest are not treated that way anyway. And the greatest are not those that, that are last. It's in, in today's world, in the, the economy of this world, the greatest are the, the owners. The greatest are the bosses. The greatest are the masters. But in Jesus' kingdom, the greatest are the servants. And Jesus showed that by example. And then last week I pointed out that we're also redeemed to give. Giving is an aspect of our love for God that we that we understand. See, when we give, we're saying to God, I understand this fact, that I am simply a manager of all that is yours, that you've given me to be entrusted with. Let me say that again. As children of God, God entrusts us, because everything that we're blessed with actually belongs to God. God gives us the air to breathe, the strength that we have. God gives us job opportunity, and it's all his. It's all his. Now, the amazing part about it is rather than say, give 100% back to me, he says, I want you to honor me with the first part. And if you do, I will understand that you understand how this works. That when you give your first fruit, you are acknowledging, acknowledging that it's all mine. I like what Rockefeller said, and I used this for example last week. He said, I would have never given 
the first tithe of the first million I made if I'd never given the tithe off the first dollar fifty I made as for my first job as a kid. Because he understood it wasn't the amount, it was the obedience. It was the fact that it was acknowledging it all belongs to God. When we give our tithe to ourselves, then we're giving our tithe acknowledging it belongs to us. We give our tithe to other people, it acknowledges the fact that it belongs to them. So those are four. Now, this morning we're going to celebrate something a little different this morning that we're going to talk about. We are redeemed to celebrate. And I really like this. I spent a lot of time. I had to take a lot of scripture and stuff out because it just got really too long. But turn with me to 2 Samuel, if you would, please. Are you there? 2 Samuel chapter 5. Starting verse 12 through verse 15. So David went there, where? The house of Obedinum, where the ark was, and brought the ark of God from the house to the city of David with a great celebration. Say celebration. After the men who were carrying the ark of the Lord had gone six steps. Man, that's not very far. Six steps. After they had gone, carrying the Ark of the Covenant, had gone six steps, David sacrificed a bull and a fatted calf. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, wearing a priestly garment. So David and all the people of Israel brought up the Ark of the Lord with shouts of blowing and blow, joy and blowing of the ram's horn. Now David's recognized as a man after God's own heart. That would be a great thing to be recognized after you're long gone. This guy had a heart after God. This guy's heart was for God. David was a worshiper. David was a praiser. David was a songwriter. David was a king. David was a warrior. David was a father. David was a lot of different things. He wore a lot of different hats, and just like you wear many hats. But one thing that David knew, being a worshiper and a, and, and a praiser, is he knew how to celebrate God. It's important that we as people that know God and are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ know how to celebrate God. Now there's a place for reverence, but there's also a place for celebration. I know that some of you were brought up in a church. How many were brought up in a church or, or in a culture that's saying dancing in a church is not permissible? Let me see your hand. It's just don't do it. Don't do it. The ushers will be at the back door, and if you get up to dance, we will shoot you <laughs> several times. I mean, everybody walks into, and it's a funeral dirge, and they're sitting there, and they're dirged down, you know, and, and, and nobody's climbing, nobody's smiling, you know, and, and if somebody got happy, you'd think they were having a heart attack. Seriously. I wasn't brought up in church, so I wasn't raised under that situation. And I always understood a dance to be a form of communication and, and a form of celebration or the expression of an emotion or feeling. That's what I always understood the dance to be. So David danced before the Lord. And David wouldn't even be welcome in 90% of the churches meeting this morning. If he came dancing in, they would just have him dance right back out. This guy was celebrating, this guy was praising, this guy was shouting, this guy was, was enthusiastic, so passionate about what? The goodness of God. Does anybody understand what I mean by the goodness of God? Okay. If you really are passionate, if you really are thrilled about the goodness of God, that means you have enthusiasm. The word here. That's literally in a translation when you go back and read it. It's, it's enthusia, which is, comes from the word entheos, which means in God. So David was doing this in God. David was doing this to please and favor God. Now, if God didn't like it, how many know he could have done something about it? 
Let me tell you how I know. Because the reason why the Ark of the Covenant that represented the presence of the Lord in the Old Testament, the reason why it's in some guy's house is because they were trying to bring the presence of God in in a way God would not accept. They disobeyed how they were supposed to deliver this holy, holy article of God that represented the presence. And, and, and somebody reached up to try to stable it so it wouldn't fall off the cart. And he dies, and everybody gets freaked out because somebody's dying trying to help God out. How many of God don't need your help out? The reason why the man died is because they disobeyed God. God says, it's not supposed to be on that car to begin with. It's supposed to have two poles run through it, four guys, one on each end. It's supposed to be carried like this. It's supposed to be brought in this way. What do you want to do? Oh, we're going to help God. We're going to, leave. you know, that's a long ways for them to walk, those priests, you know, and they, they got soreness, you know, and their joints are hurting and everything. So let's just put it on a cart, pulled in by oxen. Let's see what happens. I'll tell you what happens. Guy gets killed. Boom. How many know that when you, when you think you're helping God out and all of a sudden the guy dies, that you're probably not on the right page? Well, this guy's not on the right page. So they said, well, before anybody else gets killed, there's a celebration. They were, they were kind of enthused about it until somebody died. You know, everybody gets enthused until somebody dies. Right? So, so what happens is they said, well, let's borrow this guy's house and put, put basically put God in there, which is a whole new sermon, a whole different sermon I preached years ago about what if God came to your house? What if God came to your house today? I mean, no, I'm not going to let you go home before he gets there. I'm going to let you walk in, leave here and walk in with him. No big deal. No, cool, cool. But most people have a heart attack. Most people be freaked out. So I, I, I got I, 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 no, I to I clean the house. It's a mess. Right? Anyway, this guy has no chance to clean a house. They put the Ark of Covenant in Obedidim's house, and it's there for a while, and here's what they notice. That Obedidim's family is getting their, getting their socks blessed off, man. I mean, everything's starting to prosper. They're getting blessings. They're getting openings. They're getting favored just because God's presence is with them. Comes back to David. is, hey, you know that guy, Obedidim? Yeah, where the Ark is? Yeah. He said, everybody's talking about how blessed he is because of the presence of God. And David says, I need some of that. How many need some of that? Does anybody need some blessing from God? Anybody need the presence of God? Anybody need God there? Oh, we all need some of that. Okay. And so he goes and he gets it and he said, now, now guys, here's what I learned. See that dirt over there just turned up? Nah, we didn't learn from that one. But we're going to learn from this one. I'm going to celebrate the Lord enthusiastically and then when I Give God, show God my heart. Now, guys, this is not for you. You may not even be really happy with your king doing this because I know I'm supposed to sit in this royal carriage and I know I'm supposed to have these flowing robes and, and I know that there's supposed to be trumpets in front of me and I should be riding maybe or even a white stallion. I know all this stuff you're expecting, but you're not going to be very proud of me because I'm going to get down to the nitty gritty. I, I'm going to give God all I got. And they didn't understand what he's saying, but all of a sudden he gets there they put those staves into those poles, in those rings, and they carry it out. Six steps outside of the front door. David says, wait. What are you waiting on? Bring me a bull and give, bring me a fatted calf. It's time to slice their throat and off, make an offering to God. Now, we're talking quite a little distance here between where the ark was and where they're going to in Jerusalem. All right? Let's just take it on a shallow side, not, not, not even realistically, but let's take it like we stay within the city limits here of Lisa. Let's say we just go from here to Webb's Chapel, which it was farther than that, out on 291. Six steps. Bring me a bull. Bring me a calf. Six steps. 
bring me a bull. Bring me a calf. So you can almost count every six step there lay a dead bull in a death calf as a sacrifice, blood sacrifice. That's a lot of sacrifice. That's a lot of money. I mean, the Jewish people were not people that ate meat every meal. They couldn't afford to eat meat every meal. And here we're sacrificing the bull and the calf every six steps. But not only that, check this out. David strips down to his royal ephod as BVDs. <laughs> Maybe a towel on top of him. And he's dancing wildly before the Lord. And he's, he's doing this. And then it says, it's sick, stop. And the Bible says he's doing this with all of his heart. He's not walking out the door and going. No, man. He's jumping up in the air. He's got his arms hanging up. He's, he's, he's you know, he's doing everything. I'm thinking about that, and I'm going, just to dance that far takes a lot of energy. It never says anywhere in the Scripture that David danced before the Lord in the Spirit. It just says he danced before the Lord with all his might. So we're not talking about the Holy Ghost told David to dance before the Lord because he gave him the strength. To, no, no. David says, I'm going to enthusiastically celebrate the goodness of God, and I'm going to do it with all my strength and all my might. I may not be as wild about it when I get down 3,300 yards from where I'm going when I start out, but I'm still going to give it my all. Here's the thing about it. You may be of an age right now, you can't give it your all compared to what you did Activity by activity, point by point, that what you did 20, 30 years ago. You may not be able to do everything you could have done 10 years ago, 5 years ago, 20 years ago. But the bottom line is if your heart's still giving it your all. If you still can recognize the goodness of God no matter how old you are. Then God will accept that sacrifice. God will accept that kind of heart. God will move upon you and bless you and accept you because you are doing what you can do. Not what you can't do, but doing what you can do. Some people are not wired to be enthusiastic like David. I mean, some people are not wired to be enthusiastic. I mean, if think back at your most exciting situation. And if you were able to sit there with total excitement, not smile, not crack a smile, not raise your hands or not do any cry, and just sit there, okay. When the greatest thing in your life ever happened to you, then maybe I understand that when something great happens from God, you're, not, you're going to act similarly. Because maybe that's the way you're wired. However, if before I'm a Christian, I'm able to shout and dance, and I'm able to, to lift my hand, I'm able to celebrate, and I'm able to do a victory dance, and I'm able... You know, and then all of a sudden, just because I'm saved, I have to sit on my hands and can't celebrate the king? No, 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 no. If you have enthusiasm before you became a Christian, in your own might, you can have enthusiasm after you become a Christian. And it doesn't have to be because you feel the Holy Ghost. It's because God is good to you. Hallelujah. <laughs> David danced before the Lord with all of his might because he served a good God. A good God. I don't think David was enthusiastic about everything he did, but he was sure enthusiastic about that. It was in God. How many here consider yourselves enthusiastic people? Come on, passionate people. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands again. I'm going to look at you. Let me see your hands again. Okay, okay. Come on, let me see your hands. All right, I'm going to be looking for you in our worship and praise. Because if you can't worship and praise him with enthusiasm, then you're really not. See, because we are worshiping, praising God with enthusiasm because of who he is. Come on, somebody. All right, thank you for that. Amen. So 
I'm going to give you four reasons to be enthusiastic and celebrate the goodness of God. Go to John. <coughs> Excuse me. John. Gospel of John. 3-7. Gospel of John 3-7. Since don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. Jesus is talking here. One of the reasons why I can celebrate, I'm redeemed to celebrate, is because in my redemption, I have been saved. I have been born again. Salvation is not a difference. It is the difference in my life between before and after. Salvation, a true born again experience, it means that I have not, and I'm not controlled by sin anymore. Folks, I'm just going to tell you the way it is. When I'm saved, I'm not controlled by sin anymore. Before I was a Christian, sin controlled me. It controlled me. It didn't matter what I wanted to stop. It didn't matter what I wanted to do. I always turned around and got, it seemed like I was doing it. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. I promised myself a million times this wouldn't happen, but it happened again. And as long as sin controls your life, you have no control over sin. It has control over you. So Paul says we are a slave to sin. But the sin debt was paid by the blood of Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on the cross for me, his blood was given for me. His death was given for me. The beating he taken was given for me. It paid the price of my sin. When he took my place on the cross, it should have been Tony Hensley's, but Tony Hensley's blood and the bloods of animals could not pay the price for sin. It was only the perfect spotless lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who could pay the price for my sin. At the moment I became saved, I became, I became a recipient. I became a, a, a person that could receive all of the promises of God. I said could. They were offered to me, but whether or not I take them is something totally different. But the minute that I became a child of God, I have become an heir to all of the promises of God. Not just forgiveness of sin, not just going to heaven, but to be able to live a free life unto God. Every story from Genesis to Revelation points to God who loved fallen mankind and wanted to do something about it, wanted to restore a relationship back with him. And so he sent his son to die on the cross so that you and I can be restored in our relationship with our Father God. That may be hard for some people to understand, but everything on God's eye view and on God's side is ever since man had fallen in the garden, he was looking for a way to restore us to right relationship. He didn't want to create man so that man would die and go to devil's hell that was only prepared for the devil. He wanted to create man so that he could have fellowship. Man could worship him so that God can love man. Somebody say a good amen. So we have been saved and set free from the power of sin. And, but the question is, now that I'm saved and the power of sin no longer controls me, what am I going to do with this new freedom? This new freedom, I'm going to do what? I'm either going to use it for myself, I'm going to use it for God, I'm going to give it to somebody else to have over me. Well, that doesn't work because we know when we gave it to the devil in this world that it, had the, it controlled us. Now, some people don't think because they use the freedom we should be giving God because of our salvation. They, they, th they don't think that when they put it on themselves that that's a problem for God. It is a problem for God because you serving yourself is just as much as a problem as you serving the devil to God. There's no difference. Because the answer to this question is, who shall I serve? Joshua said, as for me and my house, I shall what? Serve the Lord. We shall either serve the world and its mammon, or we shall serve God. The glorious Son of God, Jesus Christ. We are free. So besides celebrating our salvation, one of the reasons we should be enthusiastic about redemption is we, shall, we are celebrating the, path, the fact that we have received the Holy Ghost. Everybody here that's been, become a born-again believer, please listen to me. You have the opportunity to receive the Holy Ghost. In the Bible, the Holy Spirit is referred to as the fire of God. Because fire purges and cleanses and gives light and brings, brings a clear path, gives you energy and strength. That's what the Holy Spirit does, the fire of God. He says, and you shall receive the Holy Ghost when the Spirit comes upon you, is what it says. Jesus promises, Acts 1 8, that you receive power from the Holy Ghost. One of the biggest pitfalls in the lives of Christians today is they don't have the power. Because we can serve God up to our power limit, but after that, 
it's gone. After our power, after our limitations have dropped in, then God's non-limitations have taken over. The power of the Holy Ghost. Now, I want you to understand as you turn to Acts chapter 8 that, the, that there are some here today, there are new Christians, there are some here today that we've been speaking to that do not understand the fact that there's a difference between salvation and receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Most churches don't talk about this today, but I believe we need to talk about this today. Because salvation has set us free. Salvation has caused us to be born again. Salvation has, 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 has declared that we have made Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. But salvation does not mean that you receive the fullness of what God has for you. The fullness of the power that God has available to you. Is Christ in you? Absolutely. Does Christ love you? Absolutely. If you die right now where you go to heaven? Absolutely. Based upon the word of God, whosoever calls the name of the Lord shall be saved. But, but there's a difference. There is something further, there's something out there yet to be discovered for some people, and that is to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 8.14 says, And when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there. And as soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to do what? To receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. Who are we talking about? New believers. For they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in other words, they were baptized in, unto salvation. They were saved under Jesus, right, in Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands on these believers, and they received what? Holy Spirit. When you and I receive the Holy Spirit, this is why it's so very, very important, we receive a filling, a fullness, an overflowing from God. We are not just, yeah, I got one, or yeah, I got him. It's like he's flowing over the top of the cup. He's flowing out of what I have as a container. He is moving through my life with a freshness. He's moving through my life with a newness. He's moving through my life powerfully. This is not something that I'm doing. It's something that he's doing through me. Acts 2.43 lets us know that when you and I have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and we celebrate the fact of this is that by receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we now have a deeper commitment and reverence for God. Some people have trouble being committed to God. Some people have trouble revering God, being in awe of God, reverencing God, worshiping a holy God. And that's because in order for you to make the next step forward, in order for you to go deeper and revering and on and reverencing God, we need to receive the power and help from God, the Holy Spirit. That's the crucial thing for a lot of folks here today is, is that you can be born again and you can love God and you can revere God, but with the power of God, God will lead you, the Spirit of God, God himself will lead you, you and I, to a deeper walk of commitment and relationship with God. See, some of us don't even know they can get any deeper, the relationship and the commitment and the reverence. And it's because we have not walked in the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God, when you walk in the Spirit of God, and the Holy Spirit's literally leading and directing you, you walk the same place everybody else walks, but you see and you understand differently. It's true. A person just in themselves, they'll, they'll look at somebody on the street and they'll look at somebody someplace, uh, you know, and they'll go, well, you know what, they need to get saved. And they'll quit X, Y, Z, and Z. You know, they need to stop, they need to stop their drinking and drugging and, and, and porn and adultery and all. They need to stop all that. And then they'll get right with God. Listen to me. I'm not debating the fact that needs to be stopped, but what I need to say is that that's not the problem. The problem is this. They need to make Jesus Christ the Savior and Lord of their life. Because when that happens, everything else changes. Before I came to the Lord, I didn't have an anger problem. But I was angry. And before I came to the Lord, I, I didn't have a problem with you know, certain vices that a lot of people have. 
because it wasn't a problem for me to do them. I mean, know what I'm talking about. You know what I really had? I had a Jesus problem. I didn't have Jesus in my life. And so the answer to all what seems to be a problem, the answer to all that seems to be a roadblock, the answer to the thing that seem all the things, that, listen, you can stop all of these things, all of these sins, and if you don't invite Jesus Christ in your life, you can on your own stop your smoking, stop your drinking, stop your pornography, stop your adultery, stop your drug. You can stop all that on your own. You still go to hell split out wide open if you don't have Jesus Christ in your heart. Because that is the issue. That is the problem. And when everything is done properly in the right perspective, then everything else falls away from us. Because as he increases in us, these other things decrease. I never worry about seeing a new person that's seeking God or just become a Lord. And they say, you know, I, I became a Christian, but I still got problems with X, Y, and Z. And I said, that's probably true. And we don't look sanctimonious to that down our noses because, because you don't know, my son. You must have the power. Really? I understand what you're saying, but that didn't get me closer to the answer. You know what needs to happen? I mean, I'll be honest with you. You know what, you know what needs to happen? Somebody comes to you honestly and says, I need help. I need to know what to do. And, 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 I, and, and we got to be bold enough, man. We got to be wild. We got to be bold. We got to be enthusiastic enough that we look at that person and we say, well, you know what? Guess what? Come here. Come here. Let me tell you what. You need the Holy Ghost. Oh, <laughs> We're going to pray. You're going to receive the baptism. You're going to be filled with fire. You do? Now you're saying, well, it disturbs me, Pastor, the way you did that. <laughs> well, I'm disturbed at the way you're living. And God's really disturbed. That. Do you want the answer or do you want people to pet you on the head and say, well, someday your ship will come in. Some, we're all praying for you. God, I don't need more people praying for me. I need people praying with me to have the power of the Holy Ghost. Jesus' disciples prayed, and it got them nowhere. Go to the Garden of Gethsemane. They're praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus comes out, and what happens? They're asleep. Their own prayers couldn't keep them awake. So I got, so I got to figure it out. If I want to have Jesus pray for me, or the disciples pray for me? Hmm. That's why Jesus had the disciples come and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Why did he say it? Because they said, you know, our prayers really aren't cutting it. They're not getting results. But when you pray, they, everything begins to happen. So teach us how to pray. So he teaches them, the top, they teaches them what's called the Lord's Prayer. And actually, it's a model of prayer is what it is. And, and their lives begin to change. Now, how much they actually employed that, we don't know. But the bottom line is, there's a difference between praying and there's a difference between a praying with anointing. Where does anointing come from? The Holy Ghost. It doesn't come from warm apple pie with, with ice cream on top. Somebody, somebody said to me several years ago, said, man, I had anointing this morning. I said, well, good. Well, how did you know? Because I always ask, how do you know? I had these like goosebumps all over, chicken skin all over me. Goosebumps. What do you think? I said, maybe. What do you mean maybe? I said, because the difference to me isn't whether you have goosebumps or you're crying or you're shouting or you're dancing. The difference is when you leave this place. Can you still shout when you got things going on? Can you still praise him when your world is collapsing? Can you still give God glory and lift your hands when you get a bad report and you don't know what you're going to do, how you're going to pay your bills? Can you still say, you are still God. You are still in control. You are still my Savior. You're still my provider. You're still my power. You're still my Lord. Can you still do that? When the world starts to attack you, I'm going to tell you something. With the Holy Ghost, you can. 
You can. You can. So we can celebrate the fact that we have the Holy Spirit's. Hebrews 12, 28, 29. I've got to put that up because I've got to go. But it says, Hebrews 12, 28, 29. Since we are receiving, we haven't gotten it yet. Now, we're, we're helping it to grow. We're, we're, putting, we're, we're working with God in it. But it says, since we are receiving a kingdom that is what? Oh, I'll say that again. We are receiving a kingdom that's what? Let us be what? And what? By what? How? Reverencing, worshiping God in a holy fear. An unshakable kingdom. We give God thanks and praise. My life may get shaken. My situation may get shaken. Your situation may get me. God's kingdom is unshakable. And we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven that are only on a temporary leave here on this earth. This is not our home. This is just a temporary residence that God never intended for you and I to be down here very long after becoming a Christian without help from the Holy Ghost. So I encourage you today, if you can't, you can celebrate his salvation, that's great. You can celebrate the Holy Spirit, that's great. But if you can't celebrate the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I encourage you. I encourage you to put your face before God and ask him to fill you. I, ask, I, I would go before God and say, God, I won't get up from this place until I have received your presence. I'm going to spend some time with you until I receive the Holy Ghost. We go on. Celebrate salvation, celebrate our freedom there, celebrate the Holy Spirit. We celebrate our healing. This is a divine, supernatural healing. This is not necessarily a healing that there's healing properties and elements in our body that God has put on all of us, saint or sinner alike. There's a certain amount of healing God's put in all of our bodies. But there is this absolute divine, which is supernatural type. We have deliverance from sickness by the atonement. The atonement is Christ's suffering and death that we can be reconciled with our Father in heaven. We have a reconciliation. We have an atonement. We have deliverance through the atonement. What Jesus did means I can be delivered of all type of pain and sickness, be it emotional, be it physical, be it Spiritual. We can be delivered. Some people need a spiritual healing. It's worse than they need a physical healing because they think wrong about God. They limit God. They, they put them, God in a box. You need to be healed of that kind of stuff. Your mind's messed up. You need the power and the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Gospel of John, Jesus talks all the time about him being truth and what truth is. And the truth of the matter is, you don't have any problems. All you need is Jesus Christ. And he will be with you. And he will help you. He will never leave you. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. It was our weaknesses he carried, he being Jesus. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. We thought his troubles were a punishment from God and a punishment for our own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so that we can be healed. God desires to miraculously intervene in your life and in my life. Those that are suffering an emotional, a spiritual, a psychological, a physical pain so that he can come in and heal. I'm so glad for healing. I'm so glad this morning that that's not on me, that's on him. James says if you call for, for the elders of the church and invite people that are sick to come, that come in faith, and they that pray in faith, they, they anoint them with oil and they will lay hands upon them and it says they will be healed let me tell you something. It's not those guys praying that heals them. They're just obeying what God said to do to be healed. 
They are just conduits. They are just people used by the Holy Spirit. It is the fact that God is our healer. Please listen to me. I don't understand why God doesn't heal on my timetable and why he doesn't heal some things the way that I want him to. But I'm going to be honest with you. It makes no difference to me because I know God's still a healer. So many times we get more concerned about sicknesses and things, and we should because our hearts break because of that. Don't get me wrong. Our hearts break. We're human. But our concern is what happens if this is the end? Where will they be? Where will they go? That's more of a concern than how I went. When you get to heaven and they call your name and you're standing before the gates and they pull open the book of life, they're saying, okay, all you that died of a car accident this way, all you that fell off the ladder over here, all you people with cancer here, all the other weird stuff, you stand here. That's not what they're going to say. Here's what he's going to say. He's going to open the book and see if your name's written. Not how you did. It's what you did when you were alive. Not how long I lived. It's, how, it's, it's, it's the fact of who I live for and, and who, who I belong to. Come on, somebody. Healing. Then we finally get to the last one. Is we should celebrate today, our soon coming king. A lot of times we don't think about that. We don't live in light of eternity. I think that, uh, uh, that I read an article a while back. I think it was by John de Bevere. It was several months ago. And he said that in some countries of the world, it seems like their people are happier and they stand church and they don't seem to fall away uh, from church and from Christianity as other countries do. And, and, and asking a bunch of pastors in specific countries, why are your people so committed? Why are they so enthusiastic? Why are they serving? Why, why, are, they, why are they, you know, after, after 15, 20 years, why are they still just as committed on fire? And he said, well, we do something here that you don't do in America. And he said, well, what is that? He says, we preach and teach a lot on the rewards that God gives us while we're here on this earth for what we do. We're making them aware that this is not our home. We're going to go to heaven, and, and there are rewards awaiting for those that serve and honor God. We're, we're letting them know that they don't want to go to heaven with an empty basket. They don't want to go to heaven with, with an empty account, that we must do everything we can with the breath that's within us to serve God, to love God, to be the example that Jesus told us to be, to follow the Lord in everything, so that when we get to heaven, we didn't do it for salvation. We did it because as a result of salvation, we are now living like Jesus. And if we live like Jesus as a result of really being saved, there will be rewards. And I'm going to say this to you this morning, that, that I am totally motivated by the fact that because of my love for God and motivation for God, that God wants to give back to me. I give to him by serving. I give to him by giving. But God says, you're not going to outgive the king. You're not going to outgive me. When you get here, there'll be something in your account. What? Well, I didn't do it for that. I didn't ask you for doing it. I know why you did it. You have the right heart. But look, you're not going to outgive me. Because a true king outgives the person that gives to the king. The true king. Remember what I said last week? Bathsheba came and gives Solomon, a queen of Sheba rather, came and gives Solomon all these boatloads of gold, silver, precious, everything you can imagine, priceless things she brought over by boats and stuff, gave them to King Solomon because she recognized him as a bigger king than hers. And she said, you're greater, you're mightier, they're more powerful than I've even heard about. And then when she left... Solomon loaded her down with everything that she'd give him plus some. That's like you going to the bank, depositing 100 bucks, and they hand you back a deposit slip that says 700 bucks. How many want to know where that makes it? Amen. That's the same thing. See, my father has everything. He owns everything. And there's not a bank in the world 
that can even compare to his glory. Because to him, gold and silver is like rocks on the ground. We're out there trying to grab up all the rocks. And he said, I can make some. He said, but what I want to do is when you get up here, I want you to help rule and reign with me. You know, it says a thousand year millennial that the Christians, those that, there are going to be those that come back on them with white horses. They call the rulers and reigners with him. There's a certain title given to them, rulers and reigners with them. He didn't say everybody. He said the rulers and reigners. Look it up. And they're going to rule over a thousand years. You know, you know I, I've heard this said, and I, this is, I can't say this is gospel, but it makes sense to me. Where are you and I going to rule and reign over a thousand years because of our faithfulness and serving God? When that millennial period comes, after the rapture of the church, after Jesus has come back, after the dead have risen at the trumpet sound, and we that are left are, are taken up and changed in the twinkling of eye, where are we going to rule and reign for those thousand year period? I'll give you one better. I believe it's right here. I believe it's where we lived. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? It was the area that God entrusted to you. So when you come back, you're going to rule and reign in the area that God entrusted. And everybody's going to see. Everybody's going to know the truth. Everybody's going to realize that there is a God in heaven and he keeps his word. Our vindication isn't arguing with people and protest and debates. Our vindication will be when we come riding back on those white horses. Our vindication will be when, when that trumpet sounds and, and, and Tony Hensley's taken up in his, in his twinkling of an eye and this, this body's transformed. What do you mean transformed? We get divine bodies. How many want a divine body? Anybody in this place? We're going to have a transformed body when the trumpet sounds. Now, this is before the millennium. This is before about we're going to have a transformed body. That means for you that take medicine, you don't have to take no medicine no more. And that means for you that are getting, you have bone problems, you don't have no bone problem anymore. If you have memory problems, you don't have no memory problems anymore. If you got blood problem or heart problem or high blood, you don't have none of that stuff anymore. If you got worries and anxieties and stress, you don't have any of that anymore. Because when you're changed in the twinkling of an eye, you're given a body that's changed. Man, that enough is the reason to leave. But the greatest thing is we have Jesus. So we celebrate him for our salvation. We celebrate him because he's given us the power to live a godly life. We celebrate him. Amen? We celebrate him for, for our healing. We celebrate him for the soon coming, the coming of the Lord, which can happen today. It can happen at any time. Please, please understand this. There's no guarantee that you're going to be able to make it home today. Listen, it, if, if the trumpet blows today, Hallelujah. Come on, somebody, hallelujah. Uh, I need somebody needs getting enthusiastic. I said, if the trumpet blows today, you can have my truck. You're sitting there going, I'm going. Well, then act like it. Get enthusiastic about it. Some days are just so bad, we got to find something to be good about. Amen. This is when we think about Jesus is coming back. Yes. You ever get up, and you're about ready to face a day, and you're going, I'd just rather not go through this day. I know what's going to happen at the office. I know what's going to happen here. I, I, this is due. How many ever had a day like that? Come on, see, be honest. Jesus is looking. Okay. When you have days like that, it's like, here's what you do. God. I'm your child. I'm looking for you to come back today. So if I come back today, none of this matters. If you come back today, rather, none of this matters, right? None of this matters at all. None of this matters a bit. But if you, for some reason, don't come back today, I'm still going to love you. I'm still going to love you. I'm still going to serve you. I'm still going to believe in you. I really am God. Nobody can take that away from me. I don't have to answer to anybody but you. Come on, somebody. Amen. What a glorious day that will be. Would you bow your heads all over this place?
Come here, love the Lord. Amen. You love the Lord? Amen. I've given you four reasons to celebrate. It's four reasons to celebrate when you come to this house. Your salvation, the freedom that you have, the Holy Spirit, the healing, the fact that Jesus can come back. Now, all these promises to celebrate are given to the person that has trusted God with their life. In other words, saw that they have, are sinners, asked God to forgive them, give their life to God, and become a new creation and been born again. My only question is, are you free? Does sin still control your life or has it been broken? Now, there's a difference here between being a Christian and still being tempted to sin because just because you're tempted doesn't mean that you're controlled anymore. What do you mean? Where's the big difference? Used to be whenever that dropped in, you immediately went to it. You didn't even think about it. Now you go, wait a minute, that's not right. I can't, I'm not going to do that. You can't stop temptation, arrows of temptation being shot into your head. But here's the thing. Don't let them land there. Let them go right on through. You know, it's kind of like when somebody says to you, don't talk to them. It just goes right through their head. Just let those things go right through their head, right through your head, those temptations, and keep yourself focused on God. There's a great work for you to do. There's great opportunities. There's a great mission for you. There's a great power given to you that believe to help you accomplish the promises, the, the vision that God gives you for your life. I believe that you're going to do great things in 2018. But you need the Holy Ghost. You need to be born again. Father, thank you. Thank you. We are just naked and miserable and wretched without you. We have fooled ourselves to think we can live a life that pleases you without you. God, I pray for the church in America today. That they can stand and celebrate. That they can stand and be enthusiastic for so many things. But many times it's not you. Help us to get our priorities straight. Help us to have the strength to live for you with overflowing heart. Jesus, I can't do this without you. And I thank you that you made me a promise. You said, ask and you shall receive. The reason why you haven't received is because you're not asking. So we ask this morning, do something great in our lives, said. Do something great in the life of Church on the Rock this year. I already see the last 60 days how you've miraculously changed I have seen over the last 60 days how, how you have brought people from the north, south, east, and west and now call this your church home. I've, I've seen in this short period of time where you're bringing people with all kind of situations, all kind of problems, all kind of, of difficulties, and you're absolutely forgiving it and you're absolutely moving on their behalf. You're causing a freedom to come and an inspiration, a hope to rise up within them. I'm telling you that you're here today and you've got all kind of problems. Can I tell you something? Your problem isn't what you think it is. Your problem is you need Jesus. Your problem is that you need to make him first. And when you make him first, that means something else has to be last. He cannot be last. He must be first. And if Jesus is not first place in your life this morning, but you would like for him to be. If you would like to pray and make Jesus first place in life, and listen closely, if you've never prayed to do so, I want to pray with you today. I want to pray with you today. So you're here and you say, Pastor Tony, I'm not really serving God. I believe in God. I believe in what the Bible says, but he's not first place in my life. And I want to serve God. If that's you, I want you to slip your hand up. I want to serve God. I want to make him first place. Lift your hand up wherever you are right now. I need God. I need God to save my soul. Anybody here this morning would like to be prayed for? Thank you so much. For, thank you, Lord. You're so good to us. Would you stand with me all over this place? I would like to pray for you at this time.
I want to pray for people that are here. I talked about healing. I want to pray for people here that need a healing. I would you like for you to come right now. Doesn't matter what kind of healing. Come. Come. Don't look at that other person. You know if it's you. Come. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Come. I want to pay, pray for people that to be refilled with the Holy Ghost. Come. You're not overflowing. You need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Come. I see you. I want to pray for people. You're going to be prayed for that you want to invite Jesus Christ into your heart. You lift your hand. You say, I want to, I want to invite Christ to be the Lord and Savior of my life. I want you to come right now, wherever you're at. And I want to ask whoever's here that I didn't call out what you need, but you need prayer. I want you to come. I want you to come. It could be family. It could be relationship. It could be spouses. It could be jobs. Come. Quickly. 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 Prodigals. I like, would like to have those that pray with me to come at this time. You that have been praying with me to come. Just come around the front of them, please, those that pray with me. Come on. We're going to take about two minutes now. Please understand what I'm doing. We're not asking you because we won't be coming back tonight here. There'll be no service tonight. We're having people gather in groups and, and uh, have a celebration tonight and invite people to come to a celebration. But we're going to take a couple of minutes to praise the church body, and then I'm going to dismiss all of you that are out there to go get your children or be ready. But what I, why I want you to stay for this next couple minutes is because I need your prayer help. I need your support. See, the, the realistic thing is when people pray for people, most people don't feel especially anointed to do anything. It's the Holy Spirit comes on them to do it. And we all know God, only God can do it. Amen? So would you take, this may be different for you, would you take your hands extended this way towards these folks? And you don't even have to know their name. If you know their name, pray for whoever you know. If you don't know them, God's laid somebody on your heart, see that person, that gray coat, that person, that white blouse, that woman, just, just begin to pray. Would you do that? Would you do that? Would you do that? Come on. Come on. Just begin to pray. Can we have, in the background, can we have a little music come up, please? Thank you, Lord. Now pray. Now pray. Now pray. Now pray. Go ahead. I want to hear you out there. Let's pray. Come on.